On this day, the 23rd of February, 1447, the death of Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester. In the search for a starting date for the Wars of the Roses, I think the 23rd of February, 1447, is an overlooked contender. The political situation in England, and particularly within the House of Lancaster, was radically altered on that date by the death of Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester. Humphrey was the fourth and youngest son of Henry IV, born on the 3rd of October 1390. He appears to have received a less military and more intellectual education that might suggest his father at least considered a career in the church for him. His oldest brother was Henry V, who became king in 1413. When Henry invaded France, Humphrey joined the expedition. Perhaps the defining moment of his life was to come at the Battle of Agincourt on the 25th of October 1415, when he was 25. In his desperation to prove himself on the battlefield, Humphrey found his way to the front lines, where the fighting against the French was heaviest. During the melee, he was knocked to the ground and as French knights closed in to finish him off, it looked like the end for Humphrey. Suddenly, in a flash of gleaming armour and the ringing of metal meeting metal, a figure appeared, standing astride Humphrey's prone body and pressing the French back as other hands reached in and pulled the Duke to safety. The man who saved his life that day was his older brother, King Henry V. It was reportedly at this point in the fighting that Henry was so close to the French that a part of the crown he wore on his helmet was sliced off. He put himself so close to danger to save his little brother. It's Hollywood stuff, but a moment that shaped the rest of Humphrey's life. He owed his big brother. When Henry V was struck down by dysentery in 1422, his will divided power between his two remaining brothers, the third, Thomas Duke of Clarence, having died in battle in France the previous year. The elder brother, John, Duke of Bedford, was to be regent of France, much of which was in English hands, and where Henry and his heirs had been appointed heirs to King Charles VI. Charles would die just weeks after Henry, so Henry had come within a whisker of being King of France as well as King of England. Back in England, Humphrey was to be regent there. A regency was required in both kingdoms because Henry's only child, a son named for him, was only nine months old when the king realised he was dying. A long minority lay ahead and Henry wanted his brothers to keep what he had won for their nephew, Henry VI, until he was old enough to claim it for himself. The Royal Council had different ideas though. They refused to accept Humphrey as regent in England. His reputation is as a rash, reckless troublemaker and they claimed he couldn't be trusted to rule England. How right they were is hard to tell, but it's certain that what really bothered those men was the thought of their own exclusion from power. Such a long minority meant opportunities for personal enrichment, and the council wanted room to make the most of them. They set aside the king's will, in both senses of the word, and invented their own settlement. John was left as regent in France, but in England, power would be separated into three discrete sections. The council would do the day-to-day -day business of ruling the kingdom, so the vast majority of power and authority would be theirs. What was left, they split in two. The person of the new child king was made the responsibility of a handful of noblemen who were to oversee his education and ensure he was taken care of. As they looked Humphrey up and down, they knew they had to throw him a bone. The council devised a brand new title in office for the duke, called Protector of the Realm. It gave Humphrey responsibility for the security of the kingdom. Maybe they even made him a badge. For a country at war in France, where John had full authority, it was a nonsense gesture, really. Over the decades that followed, two distinct factions appeared at the court of the growing Henry VI. One favoured the dogged pursuit of war with France to keep what Henry V had won and push further if possible. The other saw a conflict that was impossible to win, draining to fund and damaging to industries like the wool trade that the English economy relied on. They wanted peace and it was in their direction that Henry VI leaned as he grew older. 
As Henry pursued peace at almost any cost, backed by powerful men like his great uncle, Henry Beaufort, Bishop of Winchester, Humphrey and his calls to continue the war were drowned out. When John, Duke of Bedford, died in 1435, it seemed to remove another blockage in the peace process. Humphrey shouted louder and louder, but was pushed further from the centre of power so that still no one heard him. He made accusations of misgovernment and abuse of power against those leading Henry, but they were ignored and buried. Humphrey began to draw around himself other noblemen who he thought were being unfairly excluded from positions of power and from being able to offer the king advice. First amongst these was the young Richard, Duke of York, a difficult figure for the Lancastrian regime for all sorts of reasons, but now pulled close to Humphrey, whether Richard wanted that or not. The other side of Humphrey's reputation during this period was as an intellectual and a very early humanist, long before the Renaissance properly arrived. He collected books, promoted learning, poetry and the arts, and held a liberal, opulent court at his palaces. His first wife, Jacqueline of Hainault, died in 1428 after six years of marriage. Soon after her death, Humphrey married Eleanor Cobham, his mistress and a commoner. The Duke's most impressive home was Bella Court, later named the Palace of Placentia, built at Greenwich on the banks of the River Thames. For all his interest in the arts, Humphrey never let go of his commitment to the war with France, though he was in a dwindling minority now. He began to be viewed as a threat to the peace that Henry VI now desperately wanted. In 1141, Eleanor Cobham was arrested and tried for witchcraft. It was claimed that she had tried to predict Henry VI's death to see if her husband, the still childless king's heir, would become king and she his queen. She was found guilty, ordered to perform public penance, declared legally dead, placed under house arrest for the remainder of her life and forcibly divorced from Humphrey. It was a warning shot across Humphrey's bow and he took the hint, retiring from public life. In April 1446, news of Henry's agreement to hand over great swathes of land in France to King Charles and to conclude a permanent peace became public, causing outrage. Humphrey, naturally, led the opposition. It's seen as a symptom of his rashness, his warmongering and his lack of political understanding, but I think it was something very different. He knew he was walking into trouble. The episode with Eleanor Cobham amply demonstrated that, but he came out of retirement anyway to voice his hostility to the plans. Back in 1415, his oldest brother had saved his life at Agincourt. Humphrey owed Henry a debt he could never repay. When Henry died prematurely, the one thing Humphrey could do was make sure Henry's plans in France were seen through, that there was an English kingdom there to hand over to Henry's son. Humphrey's job was to preserve that inheritance, and instead he was seeing it being gifted away. I think the debt he felt he owed his brother compelled him to act. Chivalry required it of him. This made Humphrey a problem for the government. Summons were sent out for a parliament on the 14th of December 1446 to open in Cambridge on the 10th of February 1447. Things were moving quickly now. Humphrey's ally, Richard, Duke of York, had lost his position in command in France, which had been gifted to the king's cousin, Edmund Beaufort, surely because it would serve to smooth the capitulation to the French that York might resist. A decision seems to have been made to deal with Humphrey by the 20th of January 1447, when the location of the Parliament was moved from Cambridge, a university city with ties to Humphrey, to Bury St Edmunds, firmly within the orbit of William de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk, Henry's chief minister and fixer. Humphrey duly arrived on the outskirts of Bury St Edmunds on the 18th of February, where some of the King's men met him and instructed him to move directly to his lodgings and advised him that he was barred from making any attempt to see the King. After two days of this unexplained house arrest, several lords and their armed retainers arrived to tell Humphrey that he and his men were under arrest for treason. Henry VI had become convinced that his 56-year-old childless uncle meant to murder him and seize the throne, with some sources adding a slightly chivalrous edge to it with a desire to rescue Eleanor Cobham from her perpetual prison. 
Some accusations floated around that Humphrey had been in Wales before coming to Parliament to arrange a rebellion there and gather support for a coup. The Duke was arrested on the 20th of February and within 24 hours he suffered what was reported to be a massive stroke, brought on, no doubt, by the stress of the situation. He lay motionless in his bed until he died on the 23rd of February, 1447. His body was displayed to the public to show that there had been no foul play, though rumours sprang up almost immediately that he had been poisoned, and he was then buried in the tomb he had prepared for himself at St Albans Abbey. Several of Humphrey's men were sentenced to hang as traitors, but a last-minute pardon was delivered at the gallows, and they were spared. The Duke's death meant that the charges against him never saw the inside of a courtroom. So why do I think that this death on this day in 1447 is a contender for the beginning of the Wars of the Roses? Whatever else Humphrey might have been, reckless, fixated on war, frustrated by his exclusion, he was utterly loyal to the House of Lancaster. He did what he did to honour his brother's memory, and I don't think for one moment he had any intention of murdering and deposing his nephew, the son of the man who had saved his life. Opposition to the King's peace plans, which was widespread and popular because, well, the English liked bashing the French and didn't want to give in to them, was focused on Humphrey. That meant that it was contained, restrained by Humphrey's own Lancastrian blood and loyalty. When he died, Humphrey's popular support cast about for a new home, and Humphrey had given them a natural successor to his beliefs. Richard, Duke of York, whether he had wanted it or not, had always been the top of Humphrey's list of those being unfairly excluded, so it was to York that Humphrey's support immediately turned. This development was, I believe, the cause of the increased suspicion at court of the Duke of York. Henry had believed that Humphrey meant to kill him as his heir and leader of the opposition to peace. Now, not only was York the head of that faction, but he was also viewed by most as Henry's new heir too. Suddenly, opposition to the House of Lancaster had a focus outside the House of Lancaster. That only made it look all the more threatening to Henry, causing him to push York further away and alienate the most powerful man in his kingdom until the spiral of mistrust and exclusion reached its natural end, war. Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, was a patron of the arts, an early humanist and a lover of books and learning. He was also dedicated to the war with France his brother had started and been deprived of the chance of winning. The latter has dominated his reputation ever since because it suited the government he opposed to see him as irresponsible, obsessed with war and reckless. We should be wary of believing what those who brought about his death have to say about him. And I still think Henry brought about bigger problems than he solved, setting the timer ticking on the Wars of the Roses by persecuting his uncle Humphrey to his death on this day in 1447.